Hello friends, welcome to another Sunday night in the Word from here at Salem Creek Church of Christ. I hope that you've had a blessed day today. Thank you for spending a few moments with us. I pray that this will be a blessing to your life. Before we open the Word tonight, let me give you an invitation. We'd like to have you come worship with us here at Salem Creek. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for our morning worship. We follow that at 10.15 with uh, Bible school, what some people call Sunday school. That's the term I prefer. Every Sunday night at 5.30, we're back here for an hour of evening worship. And then on Wednesday nights at 6.45, we have Bible classes for all ages. Come out and join us anytime you can. Uh, our building is located at 25.25 here Salem Creek Drive here in Murfreesboro. That's in the 37128 zip code. Let me also add that if there's any way that we can help you, give us a telephone call. Our number is area code 615-893-7532. Well, it's time to get into the Word, and uh, we've been more or less going through the Bible. We're not going through verse by verse, but we're going through looking at uh, some very important passages uh, that present some crucial concepts to us tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about something I found reading through the book of Numbers the other day. It's in chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. So let me begin by reading this passage of Scripture. The Bible says that the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you mount the lamps, the seven lamps will give light in the front of the lampstand. Aaron therefore did so. He mounted his lamps at the front of the lampstand, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now this was the workmanship of the lampstand, hammered work of gold from its base to its flowers. It was hammered work according to the pattern which the Lord had shown Moses, so he made the lampstand. Now that might seem like a little bit of a strange verse for us to passage rather for us to look at tonight. What's that all about? Well back in Exodus chapter twenty five, when God was giving Moses instructions for building the tabernacle and making the furnishings of the tabernacle, he talked about that golden lampstand in verses 31 through 40 of that passage. In this passage from Numbers uh, chapter 8, there are seven that are mentioned there, and you find in Exodus 25 and verse 37 that there were to be seven of them. Very important passage in those instructions in Exodus chapter 25 was the last verse, that's verse 40, where God said to Moses, after the pattern for them which was shown you in the mountain, uh, make it according to that pattern. They were be made according to the pattern uh, that God had shown Moses in uh, when he was up on the mountain. So it was a very important part of the furnishings of the tabernacle to see to it that it had sufficient light. But as we look at those candlesticks and as we think about what's said about them here in Numbers chapter 8, I want us to think beyond the simple fact that they provided light. I want us to understand that they also had a spiritual significance. When you go back to Exodus chapter 13, and this is right after God led his people out of their Egyptian bondage, the Bible says in verses 20 and 21 that the Lord went before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Then it goes on to say that he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night. The Lord was there with him. That pillar of cloud during the day signified his presence. That's how he let them know uh, that he was with them. And at nighttime, it was a pillar of fire. And the Bible says that the Lord never took that away. What does that pillar of fire do? It, it gives off light. There's light there so that they can know that the presence of God is with them. What an important concept that was for them. And think about uh, what's said in a passage we know was Aaron's benediction in Numbers chapter 6 and verse 25. These words, by the way, 
It might sound very familiar to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. The countenance of God. Uh, that is so often in the Bible expressed in terms of light. In Psalm 27 and verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Well, if you know the Lord is your deliverer, that's uh, embodied in that word salvation, then you take great comfort. You don't have to fear. And that verse begins by saying, The Lord is my light and my salvation. A lot of people are afraid of the dark. We don't have to fear any kind of darkness, physical darkness or spiritual darkness, when we understand that the Lord is our salvation. So his presence in the Bible is very often illustrated not by some kind of feeling that we get that's like um, uh, having a bolt of lightning running through you, but it is rather illustrated through this concept of light which happens to be a very important concept in the Bible. You know, there is such a thing as moral darkness. There's a passage in John chapter 3. Uh, that's where Jesus is having a discussion with Nicodemus, um, a, Phar a Pharisee, a man of the uh, Jews who came to Jesus by night. Uh, and he says to Jesus, we know that God is with you. Nobody can do what you're doing unless God is with him. And Jesus went on to have a wonderful conversation with Nicodemus in verse uh, 16 and 17 of John chapter 3. Those uh, memorial words, those memorable words, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved in verse 19, 20, and 21, Jesus says, This is judgment, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, for his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that all his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Here is that wonderful concept of light. Light came into the world, but there were so many people who did not come to the light because they preferred darkness. Their deeds were evil. And that's uh, signified by darkness. They loved darkness rather than light. They did not want their evil deeds to be exposed. You know, uh, in a book that John wrote later on, the book of First John, he says in chapter 1 and verse 6 that if we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And so you can actually walk in darkness. Imagine being out far removed from any artificial light, in the dead of night, on a night when it's cloudy, you can't see the stars, you can't see the moon, you're walking in total darkness. That's how Jesus described the world to which he came. Many years ago, our family uh, took a tour of a cave. We got about halfway through the tour of the cave and uh, the guide stopped us and he said, now I want everybody to stand still, don't move. I'm going to show you total darkness. He flipped a switch, turned off the lights. You couldn't see anything. Even your hand, an inch away from your eyes, couldn't be seen because you were in total darkness. That's the world in which we live. And John says if we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We exist in a world of darkness. But now here's the good news. God gives us light. How does he do that? He does it in the person of Jesus Christ. I love the writings of John. Let's go to another one. In John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you were out with a group of people walking at night, that 
night in which you can see neither the stars nor the moon. There's no artificial light anywhere around except for a guide who has a light. You're going to stay as close to him as you possibly can. There's Jesus, the light of the world. And he says to us, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When you walk in darkness, there are all kinds of dangers. I'm telling you, you can get hurt if you walk in darkness. You trip over something, you fall, you could break your neck. But if you follow Jesus Christ, the light of the world, you will never be walking in spiritual darkness. You will have the light of life. And light is something really that defines the character of God, isn't it? In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says that God is light. This is the message which we receive from him and we declare to you that God is light. But how much light is God? If you continue to read 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, John went on to make it very emphatic when he says, and in him there is no darkness at all. That is said in a very emphatic way. No darkness at all. No darkness of any kind. He is perfect light. So Jesus, his son, is the true light that lights everyone who comes in, into the world. Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 9. John the Baptist was talking about Jesus who would follow him. And he says, that's the true light which coming into the world enlightens everybody. So think about it. Our Father's character is described in terms of light. Jesus, his Son, who came into the world, is the light of the world, and he enlightens every last one of us. What a powerful concept that is. Well, what about us? Is there any sense in which we have light, we possess light, or we exhibit light? You know, God always expects his people to be light. Again, in a, a world of darkness, uh, talking about light and who his people were to be and are to be, Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 3, that the nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. What does God expect us to be? Remember what Jesus says in Matthew chapter four, uh, 5, rather, in verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a basket, but they put it on a candlestick or on a lampstand where it gives light to all that are in the house. And then he challenges us with these words, let your light so shine before men that they can see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You might ask, how do we do that? I was talking with um, our son the other day. He was talking about explaining the concept of light to, um, to his children and the light that is led off by the sun and the moon and the stars. He was teaching them the lesson that the sun gives light while the moon reflects light, and actually the moon reflects the light of the sun. Now, how do we give off light as children of God? We are not, in any sense, the source of light. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. His sun is the light of the world. But when we follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, we're like the moon reflecting the light of the sun. And in this case, we reflect the light of the S-O-N, the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We live in a world of darkness. But when we walk in his footsteps, we do the things that he would do. We show his compassion to the world around us. We exhibit his morality. Then we reflect the light of the Son of God to the world around us. Psalm 119 is a very powerful tribute to the Word of God. In verse 105, the Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. When we allow that light 
to fill our hearts and fill our lives. We walk in it. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. The light of God is reflected to the entire world around us. I know how much we need that in our generation. I was watching a television program the other day. Uh, it's called Airline Disasters. You may or may not watch that. It might be a little bit too frightening for some people to watch, but it talks about um, airplane crashes and, and how um, those who are the experts, the technical experts, work to figure out what was the, co the cause of the disaster and how uh, a disaster or calamity could have been averted. One thing that they learned over the years that uh, if there is a fire and if there's a lot of smoke filling the cabin of the aircraft, people can't find their way to the exits. And so it was determined that they needed to provide lighting by which people could escape. And so they came up with something that's known as, very technically, floor proximity escape path marking. It is not necessary li necessarily light coming from the power source of the airplane. It is um, really something that is luminescent. It glows, it's bright. People are able to follow that to safety. When we show the world the light of Jesus Christ, they're able to follow that into a relationship with God that leads to eternal life, but also allows them to live a life in this world that is characterized by light rather than darkness. We live in a world filled with darkness. What are we going to do about that? Too often, we complain, we grumble about that, we gripe about that. I'm reminded of the words of a former first lady of ours, Eleanor Roosevelt. I believe she's the one who made the statement, and it's a very powerful one, it is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Those of us who teach and preach the word, sometimes we are very famous for bringing the heat. Well, maybe it's the case that what we need to be bringing is the light of Jesus Christ. Maybe we need a little more light and a little less heat. It's interesting, isn't it? You go all the way back to the Old Testament. When God has his dwelling place, his tabernacle, his tent of meeting, he ordained that on the inside there would be seven golden candlesticks. They would be perpetually lit. There would always be that light. Jesus is the light of the world. God is light. We walk in the light so that we can reflect his light to the world around us. Thank you for joining us tonight. Let's close with prayer. Father, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for being light, for sending your son the light of the world. Father, as we live in this world and become so frustrated with evil around us, help us to quietly be the light of the world and reflect your light to those around us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. Come back again next week. Until then, may God richly bless your life.